It's that idea that Roy Hargrove plays in his great soul on Strasbourg St. Denis doesn't get your stank face muscles going, I don't even know what to tell you. Today, we're digging into the source of that phrase and how Roy's playing can teach us not only how to sound great on Strasbourg St. Denis, but also can inform our entire improvisational language. Thanks for tuning in today. As it says right up at the top, we're here talking about Strasbourg St. Denis. This has become a modern day jazz standard. If you want a gig in many different styles, playing straight ahead jazz, playing funk, playing in wedding bands, this is a must know tune. It populates all over the place on the scene. And it's one that we really need to know how to sound good on. One note before we get into things, as always, I really encourage you to check out what we've got going on in the virtual studio. Today's virtual studio content is free to everyone. This is such a great tune and really we're gonna talk about performances, really one of my favorite performances in sort of the modern jazz vernacular. And I just wanted to make sure I could share this with everybody, some of the practice strategies and those type of things. Remember, what happens here on YouTube is kind of only like half of the stuff I present, maybe not even half. If you go over to Patreon, follow the link below, there is a handout that has some additional material. And especially I encourage you to check out the practice video that is there. Each week there is an additional practice video where we take some of these concepts and really break them down and actually like practice them together. We do some trading, we work on some licks, all that type of stuff. So that's all free to everybody just to kind of check it out this week and see if it's something that you would be interested in doing on a more regular basis. So getting into the task at hand, the tune Strasbourg Saint Denis, it appears in a number of different places. The studio version is on a great album called Ear Food released in about 2008. We are actually gonna talk about a live version that sort of floats around YouTube uh, from The New Morning. I think this is a Paris club. It is a wonderful live version. And to me, just one of the great live performances of this music that you can find on YouTube. Before you go any further in this video, I would actually go listen to Roy play this. The things we're gonna talk about today, yeah, we're gonna talk about some licks, some things of that nature, but you really gotta hear Roy play this. So much of what makes this great are some intangibles that we will discuss and you can really only gain by listening. So I'll put their links down in the description, check those out, hopefully those links will stay active. This is a video that sort of like comes up and off of YouTube every once in a while. I'm sure there must be some sort of copyright disputes around it. We are not gonna to listen to it specifically in here. Check out the links below to give it a, give it a listen before we go on. Did you do it? Did you listen? I really hope you did. It is such a great performance. It just makes me happy when I listen to it. It just makes me smile. So we're going to talk about three main concepts today that really make Roy's solo tick from my perspective. The three things that I think we can glean as improvisers from this are Roy's ability to play the blues, his ability to play across the chord changes, and then his ability to actually like play the chord changes. We'll break these three things down, talk a little bit about how we can practice them, and then also about some of those intangibles I mentioned and how those play a part in the solo really working. All right, concept number one is playing the blues. Now, this doesn't necessarily just mean like playing the blues scale or something like that. There's a lot of things that go into playing the blues. Let's just listen to one example. This is a transcription, a little bit of Roy's solo, about five minutes and 30 seconds in part one of those two links that you could find down in the description to the actual performance. Uh, I'm going to play it here with a little bit of backing track and we're going to see what we can kind of take from this idea. So why do I call this blues? What about this is blues? To me, it's all about inflection and sort of the vocal quality that Roy is achieving here. There's vibrato on some of the notes. The notes are inflected. There's, there's like little grace notes. There's scoops. There's kind of like little rips out of the note. All these things are what give it some vibe. Surely you could just play this idea without that stuff. It's fine, but it doesn't really have that same feel that same sort of like stank on it that when Roy plays it, that's what makes this idea so effective. It's a very simple idea. It's a pentatonic scale. To build some of these ideas that Roy uses throughout this solo, he really relies on this sort of A flat major pentatonic with a flat third. We might call this the A flat major blues scale. That's a 100% oversimplification of what he actually plays. There's so much more to it than just the scale, but this will be the best place to get you started. As I said, this is major pentatonic with a flat third, so it's the root, the second, the third, the fifth, the sixth, and the high root, but it also has a flat third in there, so both a C natural and a C flat in this case. Uh -huh. 
I often find this is one of the most overlooked little nuggets of scale information. A lot of times we were in like the blue scale, quote unquote, that we might learn in school, and we don't really get this one happening. There's a lot of vocabulary, a lot of ideas that live in this scale. So try to check it out, figure out some little vocabulary items. Hopefully, maybe learn them from Roy, learn them from another great musician. That is where it's at with this sort of information, not just another like cram the scale in, but putting it into context. Speaking of context, I'm gonna give it a go on one chorus of this tune, just trying to apply this concept of playing the blues and trying to be in the spirit of what Roy is capturing there. Now, yeah, I'm gonna play ideas that are based off of this scale, but it's really all about that inflection, that feel, those vocal qualities to our tone that we really wanna have happen. So here's one chorus, I will transcribe what I play after the fact and throw it on the screen so y'all can see what I am playing. <laughs> On to concept number two that is playing across the changes. Now this tune has chords that are almost exclusively diatonic and they're very common chords that we see often, but it can feel sometimes a little bit awkward to really like play the changes on it because they move in a less conventional way, at least in some places, than we're used to seeing these chords. For example, we just sort of walk up through the changes and that's not something we see as often in sort of a typical straight ahead jazz tune. To help us with this, since it's all really sort of in the key of A flat for the most part, we're really just gonna build ideas that are in A flat. Maybe relying on rhythmic ideas, relying on repetition, relying on just strong melodies that are in that key rather than trying to be like, I've gotta nail every single change. Let's look at how Roy handles this at the very beginning of his solo. So this starts at about four minutes into that track. Let's give it a listen of me playing this with a transcription so you can see what's going on. So, as we can see, he doesn't really bother himself with feeling like, I've got to get to every chord tone in each place. It's all about this melody that's really just an A-flat for the most part. He does resolve to some chord tones near the end of the chorus. And that's one of the things that's key about this approach is generally we want to be melodic inside of the key. And then just at the right moments, those key moments of getting to like that B flat minor seven chord to E flat seven, resolving to an A flat major seven. He just gets to some nice chord tone things there, which makes us feel like, oh, I'm back inside the harmony. It all sort of feels good. The foundations of this type of playing are still very similar to the first concept of playing the blues. However, here he uses a little bit more rhythm. He doesn't necessarily inflect his lines in the same way. There's still a little bit of inflection for sure, but it doesn't have that same sort of vocal quality. It feels more like a horn player playing rather than like a singer singing. And so that's why I labeled this as sort of a different concepts that we can take away from this of how to play across the changes, even if it's not in that sort of blues inflected way. Cool, just like the previous example, I'm gonna give you one chorus where I do this, see if I can get it done anywhere near what Roy does, probably not, but I'll give it my best shot here. And I'm gonna apply those same sort of concepts where I'm really trying to just stay in A flat, and then I'm gonna resolve the chord tones in key places. <laughs> onto our last concept for today, and that is actually playing the changes. So you could certainly just like play the changes through this entire tune, and that would be one avenue to sound successful on it. However, in Roy's solo, at least on this version of it, he really mostly plays bebop-ish ideas or change playing ideas a little more near the end of his choruses. And he applies these other kind of ways to build the solo along with a lot of like motivic preservation and sort of motivic development throughout his solo, but really relies on hitting the changes more near the end, especially where we're getting into that A flat chord and then on some of the six chords, some of the F7 chords. So let's hear a little example of this one. This is at five minutes and 20 seconds in to the recording. Again, I'm gonna play this. I'm gonna slow it down a little bit. This was a tricky lick for me and I couldn't, all honesty, play it as fast as Roy does, especially because he plays it in the lower register and kind of spans across the range. So for me, it was really tricky to get the facility down there. So I had to slow it down a little bit. 
If I practice a little more, I might be able to get all the way up to tempo, but I'd rather play it clean, really make sure I'm being accurate rather than just play it fast and it'd be a hot mess. So here it is, the idea that is kind of change playing. <laughs> Now, what you might notice is it's very arpeggio driven. That's what gives it that feeling of change playing, of bebop, is hitting these arpeggios. And he actually does it in a pretty slick way when I actually transcribed this. I was surprised how simple and logical it was. It sounds almost like hipper than I thought it was going to be. There is some cool stuff going on here. But in the first measure, let's just break it down a little bit. That B flat minor seven chord, you just arpeggio it's up, back down, and then goes all the way down to the G because in the next chord, that C minor seven, he's almost implying like, a G minor to a C minor sound, almost like a two five one. Um, it doesn't actually go to two five, or excuse me, go to F like it would. And obviously the the five chord is minor, but it's very much that type of sound, almost like a two five one going to an F minor thing. And then when he gets to that D flat major seven chord, he totally treats it like a, a B flat minor seven chord and treats it like a two five one. So a B flat minor to E flat seven resolving to A flat. Um, he does that actually a number of times in this solo where you can really tell those ideas sound more like B flat minor than D flat major. One little extra note on the five chord, on the E flat chord, he superimposes up a minor shape, a half step. So like E minor on E flat dominant seven. That's a great way to get all the alterations in there. So actually a really slick two five, that would be a good one to take through all the uh, all 12 keys. And as I mentioned, he really likes to hit those six chords and really play changes there right here, straight up bebop, just hitting um, all the chord tones in that six chord really, really clearly. So what can we take away from that? For me, it's all about thinking, well, maybe I don't need to play changes on the entire form of this in order to play a good solo. Finding those key places to really feel like I'm gonna indicate the chords here can give us like good variety, good contrast in this, can give us a number of different options to go. And then it's just not gonna be a stream of eighth notes or in this case, 16th notes for the entire length of your solo, which in all honesty for the listener is a lot of times pretty boring. You might be playing some cool stuff, but I guarantee you it's gonna go over the head of a lot of the listeners. When you listen to Roy, it's so melodic. There's so much soul. There's so much humanity in his playing that when he goes to those things that are a little more like slick or a little more musically complicated, possibly we might think about it, they really land because there is contrast. All right, one more time for me to give this a try. I'm gonna play one chorus. Again, I'll throw it on the screen and hopefully you can sort of see where I'm trying to connect some of these ideas of playing melodic, maybe playing some blues, playing some across the change playing, and then really getting to chord tones in the right places. And maybe, you know, a few two five ones, that type of stuff. If you made it this far, you might be like, Sean, well, that's all good and well, and you can kind of boil this down, and that's real academic and everything, but there's so much of this solo that has nothing to do with any of that, and you would be 100% correct. The things that really drive this solo, for me, are actually many of the intangibles about our playing, or the things that are affected by our overall musical maturity. Roy's time, his sense of phrasing, his sound, the way he builds energy through this solo are really the things that, to me, make this a great performance. Those things, admittedly, are very hard to teach and are very hard to practice unless you simply go to the recording, play it along with Roy, and try to sound as much like him as you possibly can. That is the real key. If you could do anything to make yourself a good improviser, it wouldn't be to watch my YouTube videos. I hope they're helpful for you and all that type of stuff, but it's to go to the masters and just try to do what they do. You don't wanna sound like a Roy copy. You wanna sound like you are informed by Roy's playing, that you know his playing. It taught you something and you're doing something new with it. That's all we got for today. I hope this lesson was helpful for you and thinking about this tune. I love playing this tune. These are some of my approaches. There are certainly other approaches you could take, but from having transcribed Roy playing a couple different performances of this, to me, that's kind of what he does, at least from a nuts and bolts standpoint. Now all those intangibles, you gotta work on that as well. That's what will really get you there. But if you're just working on trying to get the kind of X's and O's together of this tune, this is where it's at. All right, I'll see you in the woodshed. <laughs>